Thunder, 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 Thunder Geeks are live. Hello, Thundarians. You're listening to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at luradio.ca. That was double experience with So Fine. And of course, I'm Andrew. I'm Rob. I'm Megan. I'm Alicia. And I'm Kyle. And we're your Thunder Geeks. Thank you once again for tuning in. We are so excited. So we have a couple things to uh, for you guys today. Uh, I think it was last week or the week before we last got week. to... Last week we went to uh, Crocs to watch an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, band called Double Experience. Yeah. They were so fantastic on stage. They did uh, two cover sets of the, the Police and Green Day, but they also did their original music. They were uh, gracious enough to sign uh, their CD. We're going to be giving that away. So if you guys want a chance at winning uh, on a CD from Double Experience, rather go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Like, share, comment on the show, post our stream. We're streaming once again in the studio here if you want to take a fly on the wall. However, let's go to Double Experience, folks, and see what they have to say. Double experience. Guys, introduce yourselves and what you play in the band. I'm Ian Nichols. I sing and play bass. I'm Brock Tinsley. I play guitar. And I'm David, and I play drums. Thank you guys for joining us. How did Double Experience start? Ian and I used to play in bands that would share shows in Ottawa. Once members of those various bands decided to do something different with their lives, Ian and I kind of combined forces. And then Dav, we had done a couple UK tours at the time, and our drummer couldn't make it. Our booker said, I know a guy who can learn the songs really quick. We landed, we had a few practices. The tour went so well that we decided to have Dav come to Canada this time and uh, have more than just two practices and learn everything. So is this your first Canadian tour or do you guys usually tour the UK? It's been, uh, it's been a couple of years since we've done a cross Canada tour. We wanted to kind of build uh, the, the UK and, and Europe for the last couple of years. So um, I think after being happy with the growth that we've had in, in those markets, we wanted to come back, especially releasing a brand new record. Um, we wanted to come back to Canada and, and basically go coast to coast. We did a small Ontario, uh, southern Ontario leg. We did a small east coast leg in uh, the first part of the year. And in for autumn, just before the snow hits, we wanted to make sure that we could hit the rest of Canada as well. Oh yeah, touring in the snow was probably not very fun. And as I understand, this is your third album now? Yep. Yep, third town's a charm. When did you each start playing music? I started when I was in high school, kind of like most people, just the town I was from, people either skateboarded or did sports, and I decided to, to do none of those things and, and play guitar. Yeah, uh, same for me, really. Uh, I was probably about 11, 12 when I first started playing, but then I didn't actually own my, my, uh, my first drum kit until I was maybe 14, so... I was actually a drummer for many years before I actually had my first drum kit. <laughs> I, I would just constantly be at like a friend's house, like he had a garage and he had, he had a drum kit there. So every time he had band practice, I, I, I'd be there. And then when then when they'd be on a break, I'd be like, dude, can I can I play in your drums? And he's like, yeah, sure. So then I'd, I'd jump on and uh, and do that. So yeah, it was probably about 11, so many, many moons ago. Uh, I, I started playing when I was 11 years old as well. All, all my friends were like, yeah, guitar is really cool, and so I, I wanted to do it. But by the time I actually got a guitar, like it wasn't cool. Um, but I was like, that's okay. It doesn't matter anymore because like I have a guitar and, I, and I, I'm having lots of fun. So, and that's kind of what I've been doing since. And, and like, how did you figure out that you could sing very well? It, it was just a natural transition, I think. All of my friends, like, even after it wasn't cool, and I, and I moved and stuff. Like everybody I knew who was a musician played guitar. Nobody was a singer. And they were. I was like, I, I think I can sing. Like, so we'll we'll see what happens. And oh and man, can you sing? sing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what genres of music or specific bands do you guys each take inspiration from? Yeah, we like the musical tastes are, are wide, and I mean the guys will speak for themselves. But it's like what inspires me is if you listen to a record and then like just one band hours on end and then try and write music, it's probably going to be derivative. So all the stuff that inspires me is like the the non-musical stuff like books, you know, video games, like just stuff that will create feelings and then you can kind of go to the instrument and say, so like, how do I interpret that? But if you're just like, my favorite band's Metallica, I'm just gonna listen to their whole discography and then you try to pick up a guitar, you're going to sound like Metallica. So we, we try, we, we do listen to everything and I'm sure these guys will chip in and tell us like what, the, what that is, but we do try and keep 
our minds open to that there's more than just music that can influence. Yeah, I, I think um, just kind of continuing with, with Brock was saying about listening to one band, like your ear will get tired of, of listening to like the, the same genre and even the same songs constantly. So like going from Metallica, for example, and then five minutes later you start listening to Nickel Creek. So like I, I would listen to them just because like the as a drummer, like the rhythmical aspects of the guitaring that they do is is so fascinating. So like personally I'll pick out on 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 any kind of music. And I think it, it should be that way too of you know listening to all sorts of genres and, and picking out things from different places. But I'm a huge Incubus fan. <laughs> what was each of your first G dome? It's it's hard because like it's kind of like that's like, let alone owning an instrument. Like I didn't even own a console until um, I was like eight. But my parents would always take me to like arcades and stuff, and I had a babysitter at a Super Nintendo. And for some reason, Chrono Trigger was like the first game that I ever really just like, kind of liked. You know, like the, the characters and the, the things. So that was like the first thing I, that kind of opened the gateways to like you know like RPGs and owning. It. You have to like put quarters in every time. You can you can control it from your comforts of your boxers and. You know, that, that was definitely my first uh, experience in things that would be, I guess, considered uh, nerd is just the video game aspect. I kind of started with, like, the collectibles. I, I was never, like, a... As a kid, I was never allowed to have, like, consoles. Like, my parents were like, oh, video games are the devil. <laughs> so so I would get, like, like knockoff Pogs and <laughs> knockoff Crazy Bones. Like, you know, the stuff that they sold at the dollar store to, like, get yes. on the craze. Like, stuff like that. And those knockoff Pokemon called Digimon or something. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> But no, I mean, it was like, it was a lot of the collectibles. Um, and then, yeah, you know, friends would have video games and I'd be like, can we go to your house and play it today? Because like, I, I knew, I, I didn't care about what they wanted to do. I just wanted to play like Pokemon Snap or like, you know. Like, Goldeneye. Yeah, go, oh, Goldeneye, <laughs> let me tell you. Dude, <laughs> where was it? Leicester? Yeah. Leicester. Like, we, we, we played a show in Leicester in, in the UK and uh, they, they made a real good effort actually. And they had like consoles and stuff like as we were playing. And they had Goldeneye, and we went, we played it, and it was like the graphics. You're like, how how did we think at that point? It's like this is just this is pioneering stuff right here, you know. Looking back at it, it's like it's crazy. Going back to the old polygons, it just seems like what was that? Yeah, yeah. Even trying to control it, like it, oh it's, it's counterintuitive yeah. to how how seamless it's now become to control yeah. something in a game. You're just like Jesus. I'm like trying to like you know carve a stone here. It's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like. I, I guess the the answer for, for the question for me would be uh, the, the same as Ian, almost like collectibles. Uh, we had Tazos. You guys had Tazos? No. No. What, what is it? What is that? So it was kind of like you'd buy crisp, uh, you'd buy chips, and uh, inside the bag would be like this kind of. They're basically just like plastic discs, and they have slits around the side. And you get them inside crisp packets. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time where I started collecting them, they were like the Star Wars range. Um, they actually stopped making them because they, they were like a choking hazard. Yeah, people kept putting them in their mouths. It was like it was ridiculous. They were huge. I don't know why you'd. Anyway, um, so yeah, I, I started collecting them. But Pokemon for me was like the the biggest uh, childhood memory. Cards like, or. The game first off, like when the first Game Boy came out, like the big brick, um, <laughs> I remember being in, in primary school, like walking around like during break, playing it, um, and yeah, like me and my brothers would always be outside, my parents would be, go outside and play, I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know, you'd be like underneath the tree like playing it, so. So, who's the huge Godzilla fan? <laughs> uh, I, I technically, I guess it'd be me. Like, I do like monster movies, and when I, I suggested to the guys like we should we should do this Godzilla song, they were like, I had never had any sort of. I never heard the song. Yeah, before. It, exactly. So, I, I suppose technically I'm the biggest Godzilla fan, but who doesn't love like a cheesy '70s sci-fi like grindhouse kind of movie? So, for for someone who wasn't wild about uh, Godzilla, I had a ton of Godzilla toys as a kid. Yeah. It was like when they when they redid the Godzilla movie in the late 90s. 98. 98. 98. Matthew yeah. Broderick. It was like I had all the toys from that line. It was like that Christmas, everyone was like, well, get get Ian Godzilla toys. My whole like... It's like I mean, it's an obvious continuation from like young fascination with dinosaurs. But yeah, yeah. It has yeah. like a laser beam. And, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it's like 
it's just like as you grow older, you're like, yeah, who needs like a rubber dinosaur when this rubber dinosaur shoots, you know, like yeah. has a special tax. And, and, the, and who didn't walk around the living room with their brothers and sisters and be like, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> 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 you know, it, it, it happens. So like that one when, when we were at the concert. The Go Go Godzilla song is probably the one that like gets the most hype. I believe that's like the one that. Do you feel like that's the song that gets people most interactive with you guys? I I, I guess because we we kind of designed it that way. Like it has that Go Go Godzilla hook. Yeah. That is kind of easy to get, kind of cotton on to. So we we try to create all these moments in our live show like on, on purpose. So that was like after all the shows that we've done, we were like, if we do this here, chances are people are just gonna have a big smile on their face because it's like the one time in their entire life been at a rock show, which is typically serious, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and everyone's taking themselves seriously. And to see a band just sort of cut loose and go, you're now gonna sing about Godzilla with us. I think it's it's a, it's the big icebreaker and the tipping point where people go, I'm glad I got to see this band. And, and we're, and we're proud of that because we set out to like achieve that. And I see you have a hashtag too, so. Yeah. Hashtag go go Godzilla. We're just about done filming the video for it. In in all of the touring, scheduling, and booking, and the playing, it's kind of fallen by the wayside. But I think when we come back home, it'll be wrapped up and ready to be released. But we're like, can't say too much about it, but it is far and away the sickest video we've ever done. We all came together to like film it, you know, create the set, you know, act it out. It was, uh, yeah, was I mean, like, we're, we're talking like, you know, hundreds of hours worth of like no joke yeah like building this set and, and that's <laughs> all i was watching the promo video for just the pokestop lure for lure the lure tour, tour yeah. the pokestop and it was dav my acting was amazing i know <laughs> just walking up to a pokestop but the thing is is like i've taken film classes before and like from, from that aspect you guys did like a really good job like framing all the shots and doing all that stuff, so do you guys have that kind of film eye, or is it just... I, Dav's like the photographer, and I'm, I've am i always kind of been, all the videos for our band, like I'll, I'll edit them, but it'll be, you know, like the, for tour footage, we all sort of have the camera and we do our part, and I think it is just a culmination of, you you work with people that complement your skill set, so everything that we do is like, we all kind of give the thumbs up to every aspect of it, and yeah, like we're... I'd like to say like we're, we're all fairly creative people, so I, I don't think it matters if like we're not like an expert on the camera. Like I, I think Brock's amazing at like doing his editing and stuff, and I he's de he's definitely got a good eye, and you'll you'll see that in the Godzilla uh, video when it's done. Like it's, it's yeah, like so, some people specialize in the selfies and the duck faces, and we specialize in again like trying to just like use all this other extra stuff as like an extension of the music and the message that we try to send. What did make you guys choose nerd rock? Because as you said, a lot of rock bands, it's, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. What made you guys choose nerd rock? It, it, it's who we are. Yeah. Like, I think it's this one thing that we always come back to where it's like, it, it's us being honest. Like, we're not the dudes who like stay up till eight the next morning, just like railing lines of drugs and, and it's just like we're, we're so not the band we, we will literally you know what what used to be sex drugs rock and roll is now Wi-Fi signal Pokemon Go and rock and roll and it's just like that, that literally is like our day to day life we it inspires us we if, you know if we could be professional video gamers I think we would we would have done that instead but it was easier to be in a band so here we are yeah I mean like we we want to be authentic I think we want to be real in our, in our songwriting and like we, we want to pull from the world around us, right? I mean, you don't want to write about things you don't know. And for us, it's like, this is the world that we engage in. Comic books, video games, science fiction, uh, Pokemon, all, all, all that kind of stuff is, is what we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis. So it just made sense to have that translate its way into our music because it, it's, it's just, that's our worldview. Yeah, and, and even like the, to, to cap off everything Ian just said is, uh even a song that has nothing to do with video games. Like, let's say we have a, a song about long distance relationships, which everyone in the band is, is well versed in. You know, so it, like, essentially it's, you know, romance spanning space and time. So we just take that extra step and go, let's ride from the perspective of like, you know, time travel. And your second album, it was named 721835. I'm curious, what's the story behind that? It's, uh, it was lead speak. So we, uh, we wanted to write the word tribes. And it was just... Oh! <laughs> wow! Yeah, I was like, 
I don't get it, but now <laughs> it, it makes it, an entire it, amount it, of sense. It, well, one of the things that we liked about it was it would interviewers would be like, so 721,000, and you know, I mean, there were all different ways of interpreting the title, and I, I just thought it was funny to to make it like a conversation point, because the first thing you look at it is you go, what the hell is this, uh, is this title? So it was just a good icebreaker, I think. When you guys start writing a song, do you start with the music first or the lyrics first? A bit of both. A bit of both? Depends on the song, certainly, um, you know, because certain... Certain sounds on the instruments can evoke a feeling where I'm going, oh, well, this is how I, this is what this makes me feel like, this is what I think the song should go in. And in the same way, if, if a lyric has, you know, it's, it's a, a happy set of lyrics, then that's going to also kind of influence a little bit how the, the, the instrumentation goes. So it, it, it's a lot of give and take. Yeah, yeah. A, a, a wise man once told me there's no right way to write. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it, it, it is like, like if you can, if songwriting is like a cumulative process, as soon as you wrote one good song, you're like, yep, yeah, we can do that ten more times and I'll call it a day. So I think every time you write, it's always like, I don't know how to do this, you know. It, it, but like you said, it'll take a word or a new set of chords or someone would be like, we should write a song about this topic. And then you go, yeah, and then you kind of brainstorm and extrapolate. So it, the more you can keep it fresh, the better chance you have of writing more. Speaking of that, has there ever been a moment where you're like playing something or reading something where you're like, we gotta make a song about this? Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the Destiny song. Destiny song for sure. Um, oh, yeah. Freak out. Freak out for Destiny. <laughs> I just, as soon as I heard that song, I was just like blown away. Like, I cannot express to you the feelings that went through my body, but they are. Probably a little lewd, so we'll not get into that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much when she found you guys, we had raptor noises for a good hour. She's like, they're coming here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we have to track them down. Uh, I just, no, it was, as soon as I heard that song, I was hooked. And, and then I started looking into the other ones, and then, yeah. And, and yeah, and that's like, for our opinion, it's like, you know, we're not here to be the band that just writes Destiny songs. We want to show people that there's like this, like, you know, seven dimensions to our band. And, you know, even if people are like, oh, you're the nerdy video game band, it's like, no, that, that's, that's sometimes. And as we have the songs that are just about how hard it is to be on tour, because again, it's, it's, it's our worldview, it's our experience, and we're not trying to, like, either fit into a, to a box necessarily. So, like, yeah, the more songs we can write, the more we can be inspired, write songs differently. It's going to lend itself to this, like, seven dimensions of, of uh, material. So what is your favorite Pokemon? Uh, I'm a huge Growlithe fan. Like, I, I love dogs, so I, I was always attracted to, uh, to to Growlithe. Also, being, being a Welshman, like, Charmander was, uh, was always a favorite just because he was like a dragon. Uh, I also like Cubone, for whatever reason. And me, it was, uh, it was Primate. He was sort of like the, the underdog. He wasn't like the most flashiest Pokemon, but I liked him. I liked him in the show too because he like stole Ash's hat and he's yeah. like, ha ha, look at me, I have he, your he hat. Had nice, he had a nice character arc from being this unruly force of nature to being like a best buddy to Ash. Yeah. This is where Ian admits. <laughs> I, I can't pick one. To it's hard to choose. <laughs> no, it, it, it is hard to choose. I mean, like, like, weirdly enough, like Ponyta always stuck out and I think it's because it was like, I, I think it was like the first card I ever pulled out of like a pack. Um, so you just like aww. imprinted on it, like as yeah, soon as yeah, you saw yeah, it, yeah. you're like a baby duck. It's, it's just like, I, cause I was like, Ian's I'm, a brony confirmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's what he's trying to say. <laughs> no, I mean, they, you know, they, yeah. No, no, there's, 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 there's no going back. No. <laughs> confirmed. It becomes a pretty unicorn, right? I'll, yeah, I'll, like, I'll see your brony con in 2017. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you is the best Destiny player? Well, Oh, <laughs> yeah, and then again, it, best is subjective because we, cause at least Ian and I play it because because of like the team aspect of it. Like we're not the Trials of Osiris like hardcore players. Like we're all about like the raiding, the camaraderie, the that sort of. Well, Do you guys all so, play a different class, or? I mean, I get carried. Yeah, I, I'm a hunter. <laughs> you're the hunter, and you're the titan. I'm I'm a big rookie. Like I I've yet to really delve deep into it like these guys so I'm uh, waiting for the right moment of time because like time's been yeah. just not available for us right now to actually sit down with the guys and be 
let's do this. Because yeah, it's this. like as a band, you're constantly. That's like it's sort of like the double-edged sword a little bit, where yeah. it's like we're inspired by video games, and it's got to the point where we don't even have time to like do the video game aspect anymore. So like there needs to be kind of a give and take. Yeah. At some point, or else we're going to be. Uh, people will go, I'm questioning your nerd credentials because you're always on tour and never playing video games. And we're like, damn, you should play video games. So. When you play video games, you're like, are you guys really a band? Like, you guys have a band. <laughs> <laughs> you have a real job. Yeah. You don't even Twitch. <laughs> you don't even Twitch, bro. Which video game is more your forte than that? <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, what, when I was growing up, like, I was a, I was a huge uh, rugby fan fun like sport was was a, a big deal in my town so like I did like playing FIFA and all that because I, I had a, like two younger brothers so like they would always want to play football and it was just an easy multiplayer to, to, to go through um, so that, that that would probably be be it for now yeah, no, no hate against sports games because like my one of my favorite games is SSX Tricky, which is oh, like my, yeah. <laughs> my favorite character is Simon, and he's Canadian and he's crazy. So yeah, yeah. Dreadlocks. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I wanted to. Uh, I was playing on the GameCube, and I guess he had a costume in like the the Xbox version where he had like a, like a chainsaw strapped to his back. But the GameCube version, it was like they like it was too like X-rated. Really? Yeah, so it was like I don't remember him ever owning. A chainsaw. You have to unlock. You, you it was. Like, I had the Xbox, like the Xbox first gen. Well, then it, it, it was. Either, it was either that or it was um, like the PlayStation. But one of them. I'm looking up on like Game Facts where it was like had to all the unlockables and how to get them, and it was like get the uh, the psychopath skin, and you're like, what? What's the like, brackets not available on GameCube? And I was just. <laughs> So before we let you guys go, we always like to play games here on Thunder Geeks. So we're just going to ask you this or that. We're going to give you one of two options. Each of us, you know, we'll go one, two, three. Give us your answer. All right. Okay. Sorry. Are you a lover or a fighter? Lover. 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 Marvel or DC? Marvel. 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 DC. Ooh. Ooh Davin Cartwright. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? <laughs> you can't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Stop. Team Cap or Team Iron Man? Ooh, team Iron Man. Yeah, Team Iron Man. That's so. Would you rather be eaten by a horde of gerbils or a flock of ducks? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll take the gerbils. Ducks. Yeah, ducks. Tacos or pizza? Pizza. Taco. <laughs> uh, yeah, P pizza. Pizza. Pirates or ninjas? Pirates. Pirates. That's a tough one. I love pirates, but I mean, it's like ninjas. Burned to death or frozen to death? Mm. Frozen, absolutely. Frozen. Yeah. Frozen. Stay the way from fire. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Uh, waffles. With uh, chicken on them. <laughs> Pancakes. <laughs> Hollow deck or Matrix head jack? Matrix head jack. Hollow deck. Matrix. Batman or Superman? I'm Batman. Superman. Batman. Would you rather wipe with sandpaper or poison ivy? <laughs> Ooh, sandpaper. 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 Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. 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 Vomiting uncontrollably or pooping uncontrollably? Pooping, because then you can still use your phone. Vomiting. <laughs> uh, I, I say the pooping. <laughs> and our final and most important question: Who has the better booty, Dick Grayson or Peter Parker? Ooh, Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson. Mr. Parker. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. I, I, I'm feeling this. I'm very happy about this. <laughs> I've been arguing for the beauty of Dick Grayson's booty for and so I've been long. I've saying Peter Parker all the way. P Peter Parker has a bony Here's little... Here's the thing. Peter Parker's supposed to be a teenager. I feel really creepy. And... <laughs> <laughs> Double experience. I guys, I want to thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, for our listeners, where can they find you online and where can they find your music? Uh... 2xxp.com is sort of like the nexus for our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, eHarmony, like just everything that we have uh, is can be found through there. 
and enjoy us on Spotify too. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, we hope to see you again. Yeah, okay, guys. Thanks for having us. Fun. Okay. Thunder Geek. 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 And we're back. Oh, man. It was so much fun being able to sit down with Double Experience. In a pool. In, well, near a pool. Near a pool, at least. Uh, so, guys, we're going to head to our first break here. Though, if you want a chance at winning Double Experience's newest album, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Autographed. Like, autographed. Autographed version. Like, comment, share on the uh, show post or on the stream, and we'll give you a shot at winning. We're going to head to our next break here, and you're listening to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll be right back. Hello, this is Weird Al Yankovic, and you're listening to Thunder Geeks on 102.7 FM. And we're back. Thank you so much for returning with us, guys. That was a, once again double experience with AAA. And the amazing Weird Al letting us in. <laughs> and I met him. And drop. <laughs> okay, Rob, that was terrible. I don't even want to count that one. What? Hey, the list is over. We did the year. Okay, okay, fair, fair. But, of course, you guys are, are listening to 102.7 FM CILU. We not only got to speak with Double Experience last week, we were very, very lucky today. Uh, Brian, Kyle, Kyle who would we meet? Oh, my God. Just some guy. Literally. We got to interview the greatest man alive. Literally, Kyle's god. Se well, second god. There's still one stage above Mr. Brian Drummond, our lovely Vegeta. Yes, Brian Drummond was the special guest for ThunderCon, uh, and he is known for roles such as the original Vegeta in the Ocean dub yep. for Dragon Ball Z. Uh, he did Ryuk in Death Note. He played Wolverine a lot of the... Uh, uh, I think, well, it was the Wolverine vs. movie? Yep, yep. and he also Wolverine. did Zex Marquis from the original Gundam Wing. And he was Sakura's dad in Card Captors. And he was Yasu. And, he a, ton of and a ton of ponies. Uh, yes, he has this amazingly long resume. It was so great, uh, gracious for him to sit down with us. Okay, so let's yeah. throw to the interview here. And guys, if you want to take a look into the studio with us, of course, do so on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. We will be giving away an album today from Double Experience signed by them. Go like, share, comments on the show post of the stream. You'll get a chance to win. Brian, take it away. So we're here with Brian Drummond at ThunderCon. Say hello, Brian. Hello, ThunderCon. Hello, Thunder Bay. So we have a couple questions for you here. Kyle? Now, first off, I want to know, how did you get into voice acting and live acting? How did I get into it? Well, I, I loved um, theater when I was in school and in high school. I took theater grade 10, and, and, and it was fantastic. It was the first time I'd done it because I grew up on a thoroughbred racehorse ranch. So it wasn't something that, um, you know, that I was, I was doing at home so much. And um, started in theater, uh, loved it in high school, and I auditioned for one of the top theater schools in the country, Studio 58, based in Vancouver, and got in. It's not that easy to get in. They take about 16 kids out of, you know, three, four, five hundred uh, applicants every year. I got in and I took that program, so which is a great um, sort of base for a performer. And when I got graduated from there in the early 90s, I started working on stage, touring theater companies, um, a lot of the Vancouver sort of uh, uh, movies that were being done in Vancouver, a TV series like X-Files, Stargate, Smallville, all that stuff that was being done in Vancouver through the 90s. And in the mid-90s, this stuff, this voiceover stuff was seemed to be really taking, taking off late 80s and early 90s in Vancouver, and I'd heard about it and thought I might like to try something like that out. I auditioned for a show called Reboot, um, which I did not get a role on, even though I wanted to. But my second thing I went out for, called G.I. Joe Extreme, was a new G.I. Joe sort of reboot of a G.I. Joe series, which only lasted for a season. It didn't go over that well, but I landed a lead on it. Worked with Sue Blue, who directed most of the early Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, uh, an L.A. director, and, and just loved what I was doing. And the second thing I auditioned for was this crazy show about a bunch of Saiyans from this, this, this weird planet, and one little guy named 
Vegeta, and uh, I got that role. That was one of the second ones. So for, it went from there. I started on um, mid '90s uh, working on shows, and it, it went from one or two shows a year to two or three to three or four to four or five to. Um, by the time it was um, um, into early 2000s, I wasn't doing any other kind of work, and then into early into the first part of the 2000s, I, I, I stopped doing much film or TV or theater at all because voiceover took over everything I was doing. I was just so busy weekly um, on numerous shows that I couldn't do anything else. And that's how it began, began and that's how I got here today. Ah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. So I noticed a strange thing when I was looking through your resume. Uh, in mo a lot of your live action roles, you tend to be security guard. Mm. Is it possible to be typecast as security guard? No, but it's one of those roles that I know I didn't have a beard back then, and you know, sort of your younger guy out of theater school, and and but I'm I'm sort of a a pretty I look I can look a lot like a cop I think so I played security or cops and they tend to be roles that are that are smaller and and easy to cast and when you're starting out because that would have been early in my career you're not going out for the leads in movies they're casting you know sometimes more experienced people or even you know American actors and I was going out for the smaller roles and tended to land a bunch of them that was one of the things that that made me not as excited about the the film industry was I found I was playing lots of cops security guys FBI agents, you know, firemen or things like things that just weren't as exciting that sort of were, were, were put into a scene to move the plot along, but weren't really part of the plot. And it's more exciting when you have a character that has a bit of a, an arc or, or, a, or some, some type of a, a change in, in what happens to them through the, through the storyline. And, and none of the roles that I, that I had early on were like that. And as soon as I started doing uh, voiceover, I found, wow, this pays like film and television, but some of these characters have such great personalities and great arcs to where they their character starts and where it ends, like Dragon Ball Z, and some of the shows, like me having chances to play things. Even in G.I. Joe, the character would start somewhere and you get to do 26 episodes mm -hmm. of something. So you got to really build on something, which felt a lot more like theater to me because in the shows I did in theater, I had much larger roles and better arcs and, and, and got to play really interesting characters. But film, it was a lot of the same kind of stuff, and and it's a small, small town, Hollywood North, and they sometimes uh, casting directors can see you a certain way and go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then when you land roles, they think they're you're a, you're a good option for it. So when you land the role of the cop or the security guard, then you get called in a lot for it. Oh, Brian would be good to that. They want someone who's good for this. You come in, you get another one, and then you get another one, and it's it can be a little tough to break out of it. So, the voiceover industry was something that I that that I fell into that I loved that broke me out of it. Right. Um, so you spoke about um, you applied for or attempted to go on to reboot, right? Yeah. Um, have you had any other roles that you ideally want to play, like anything that you're looking forward to or something that you really want to do? Um, I've had I kind of had the question before. I, I mean, I love uh, every role is, and so many roles are roles that haven't been voiced before. Like we'll we'll get a a new show come along, and it'll be some random name. It's like you know called super something or crazy monster or something like it's just got some different name i have no idea what it is they'll send us pictures of characters and they say it's about a group of kids that fight monsters or a group of kids that are that are doing this or that or or it's about a bunch of aliens that are you know and you don't know anything about it yeah. except the pictures a slight character description you know he's the wise ass he's the leader he's the, and then they want you to bring your take on it Okay. And so it's so I can't say when I haven't seen something that that's a role I really want. But sometimes I'll read something and go, oh, that guy sounds fun. And I come up with an idea of what might work, send in your auditions or audition on the day, and then you hope to land a role in it. I just like working. There's not specific things I like. If some more um, Marvel series came along and I was able to do some more work as Wolverine or some of the other characters I played, that would be great. And any shows that we, like even I was talking to people about Geronimo Stilton today, we've done three seasons of that. It's a really fun show to do and great um, great scripts, and if whenever the phone rings, they said, "Yeah, we're going to do another season." That's always exciting to hear as well. So, because you did do Wolverine, I'm curious: do you channel your inner Canuck just to go full Wolverine? Oh, absolutely! Well, come <laughs> on, who who wouldn't channel you know channel the inner Canuck to play to play Wolverine? And I'm I might I may maybe be the first Canadian that actually played him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, so it's. Uh, 
but I don't know. It's a, so much of it is is just about vocal quality and and um, and ha- and having a certain vibe to to how the voice comes out. So um, you know, I think I I had matched some sounds that they had heard before, had in their minds for what people start to think Wolverine sounds like, and um, uh, and it just worked as far as I mean, it, it it's not really fully to me creating an original character because. You know, you have to. It, Wolverine's a certain way, and when he's been in, when he's been in so many films and had, there's been so many series with multiple different voices, it's not like you can say, you know, I want him to sound like this. He's going to be. In a, I think it'd be really fun. You're right. You've kind of got to go. You know, find out that well, well he's going to be gravelly. He's older. He's grizzled. He's beat up. He's like he doesn't take the crap from anybody. So you've got to f- channel that aspect and. Maybe no I'm, sparkling uh, yeah. snickets. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Snicked. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, how do you prepare for like in the studio to do voice acting? Do you have any like warm up routines? Do you have anything that you do specifically beforehand? Uh, the day starts with a good, you know, a couple of cups of the nectar of the gods, some Java. You got to get rolling for that. I usually try and warm in. I live about a twenty, maybe twenty five to depending on traffic, 35-minute drive from the city of Vancouver where most of the studios are. Okay. So um, usually the longer you have a chance to get your voice warmed up in the morning, the, the better. So I'll use that half an hour at least on my way in. Sometimes do a couple of vocal warm-up things when I get up in the morning or singing in the shower or whatever like anybody does. Yeah. And then um, as, as I drive in, I'm trying to kind of go through my range and go up and down and, you know, lots of Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers and try and get your lips moving and things right. like that it's because you don't want to be like, you know, stumbling over your words when you start. And lots of shows, we start right at 9 a.m. So you got to get in there and be ready to go with your voice. And if it's one that's a higher range that I know I'm going to do, I'll try and get myself there. And if it's lower and deeper and gravelly, I'll try and just get myself ready to do that too. Okay. So I've heard many a uh, story of how DBZ cast have passed out in the booth. I'm curious, have you ever? Um, no, well, I didn't, wow, I'm, su- uh, I'm surprised many have passed out. It's not that great to pass out in the booth. I've felt many times, and not just on Dragon Ball, but on any show that's lots of real intense screaming or yelling or angry monsters or villains that really get they want powerful noises or or yelling over the sound of like they'll say there's going to be lots of background sound effects in here so it's got to be huge so bring bring a lot that sometimes can make you know all of a sudden everything kind of goes you know and things get really you know if you stay i have never passed out before but i've had a couple times where i've sort of done a huge yell and then i stagger back a little bit after and go okay before we do another take give me a minute i need a drink of water and you get sort of an instant like migraine and you sort of stumble a little bit i've had that happen lots of times and that's not every time i do it i go that was bad i should really not be pushing that hard and usually you know you got to take it back a notch or two after that because if you're going to the point where you're, you're losing oxygen to your brain because you're yelling that loud, you're probably pushing it a bit too hard. But yeah, that's probably happened at least half a dozen to ten times for me, to me before. But I'm getting better now to know that I don't want to push that hard. And early on in my career, though, I did. With the amount of roles that you've um, you've played and done throughout the ages, <clears throat> do you ever expect? Did you ever expect to have like the fan base that you have now, like to be? Like me, for prime example, a shaky little man in front of you. <laughs> Anything like that? Not at all. No, I, I, um, no, not for voiceover. Not at all. I never thought for once when I when I started doing voices and and I wasn't interested in doing it because oh, there's crazy great fans out there. That's why I want to do this. I didn't have any idea that that the fan bases existed for things. I'd heard of Trekkies. Maybe before, and there were some Star Wars. There was a few sci-fi conventions that might have that I was aware of when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, not one I'd ever gone to. Um, even Comic Con was a very new venture, and it wasn't sort of what it is now. So I I had no clue that anything like it existed. And I remember going to the first um, convention I went to. I went to something in Boston, and there were these people were just bananas about meeting me and I was like really new to it. it wasn't like I'd been to a few I was like what is the matter with these people I'm like <laughs> I'm just some dude that does voices <laughs> like I had no clue why they were so crazy I was in one I was having lunch I think in between um, doing a panel and having lunch and then I think I had a couple things that afternoon at this convention probably back in the end of 99 or maybe 2000 
and some, someone knocked on the outside door to the lunchroom where we were having lunch with some of the promoters. And, and uh, then when someone went outside, talked to somebody, then came in. And he's like, oh, Brian, um, uh, we'd really like to know, can you come out? There's this uh, young girl. She's 16 or something. But she actually has to leave the con now. She was only able to be here for sort of half of it. But she has to go. And she really wanted to meet you before she goes. I'm like, oh, cool. No problem. So I said, go out to meet her. And she almost passed out. I came out the door. And she was like... <laughs> <laughs> and she started probably, I was like whoa whoa I was like it's okay I'm just like I just but I mean, don't want to meet you all weekend long I'm like stop stop just breathe and I was like I, that was I still to this day could visualize meeting her going this is so weird to me because I never felt that about anyone in my life <laughs> you know even if I met probably a superstar right now I would not get that panicky yeah. um, about it and I you know there's people I think are fantastic and I'd be like probably nervous to meet uh, but not as sort of hyperventilating like she was. Yeah. And that's when I was like, there's some serious fans out here. <laughs> like, I'm talking serious. And that's when I realized, you know, there's, if there's one, there's more. <laughs> well, we've always suspected Kyle of being a 16-year-old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, that was me. Yeah, um. was good. <laughs> so again, while looking through the whole resume, I noticed a lot of voices on My Little Pony. Yeah. I, I've got to ask how and why well my little pony is one of the biggest shows on in te on television right now it's massive and it's uh it's done in vancouver it's one of those shows as well that i don't think anybody thought because i had done a rendition of my little pony i think sort of the third rendition of it i played spike um the little dragon for uh for 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 the show when they brought it back for a for a couple of other made for tv movies and and even a, a touring live show, I did the voice, and I wasn't touring with them, but I did all the songs and the live stuff that the, the puppeteer underneath had in the mm -hmm. costume had to dance around to. And so it, when, it was, when it came back again, I was like, oh, My Little Pony again. They keep trying to bring this dead horse back. And I thought, <laughs> here it comes again, you know, Hasbro trying to pull this one out. And then uh, uh, the girls auditioned for it. I don't think any of us thought really it was going to go anywhere again I thought well it'll probably be one more season of this and they'll realize come on people let's be original and come up with a new idea for an animated show but then the writing was really great on it and they sort of the characters were a little more interesting than they were before it wasn't just about combing your beautiful hair and, mm -hmm. and how to drink tea with your pinkies up and stuff like that it was it was different and um, obviously all the main cast were originally were female roles initially and they, they went with Spike they wanted more of a young boy voice so they went with the woman that played Spike's role but there was always a, they, you always have to have there was always a few male ponies that were going to show up and I auditioned it was quite there's a funny story me and Peter knew were there I was there to play a doctor or I mean uh, uh, Mr. Cake uh, Mr. Carrot Cake initially and then Peter knew was there he uh, uh, to audition for something else and they uh, the director brought us both in we were the only two guys that were recording the episode that day and said um, we need a we got some some pony that uh, he just says like one word it's like yup or something like that so I was like oh uh, and they said Brian can you just come in he's kind of a southern pony um, can you uh, come in and give your version of it and Peter do yours and we're gonna get one of you guys to do this guy so I was in there and he, I said what does he say he says so like yup like as in yes I'm like oh so I did a couple of yup or yup and then Peter went in there Yep, yep, you know, and, and then, then I was like, okay, and then they came out, oh, they gave it to Peter, he's going to do it, and I'm like, whatever, <laughs> you know, and the one line, and I'm like, geez, it turned into like this huge part on the show, this one big Macintosh, it's like this one role, but they always need male roles, and they'll, they'll call in, you know, a lot of us as performers to audition for them, and when we're there, sometimes they'll give us roles just on the spot if they if they know we can do it, or just call us in specifically to do stuff um, when they know we're we're fairly experienced. So that's why, and the reason why I've done a lot of roles as well is because it's done six seasons. So over all those seasons, you know, the few guys show up in this season, a couple new guys in this season, a couple new that season. Before you know it, you've played twenty different parts on the show, right? So that's how it happens. <laughs> now I've had someone ask me something to ask you. Sure. Um, have you ever watched Dragon Ball Abridged at all? Yeah, and yeah, I what have. Are you, what are your feelings on it? Like, how do you think it plays on Dragon Ball? Do you like it? Yeah, no, I think some of the stuff is hilarious. It's great. I mean, I'm all, anybody who likes to dub smash whatever they want, that's basically, <laughs> it's early dub smashing yeah. is what it is. So it's, uh, um, uh, uh, I like it. You know, there's some, some of it's pretty funny. And, you know, when it, anytime writing is original, and performers are creative. It's like you know more power to you as uh, as far as I'm concerned. And Team Four Star, those guys are they do some crazy funny stuff. So it, it's uh, it's I find it all humorous. It's great. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. 
So one last one for me is how different is voice work from live action work? Like what are key things besides the booth? Uh, well, the key stuff, it, it's the great thing about it is time-wise, you're, there's not, you basically when you show up to work, you're pretty much working right away. Like when we show up at 9 a.m., if you're called for a 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. session, maximum our session is usually four hours, so you can do two in a day if you do a 9 to 1 session on My Little Pony, and then maybe, you know, two to six, I'm doing Dino Trucks or something like that, you, do, you can do two sessions a day. Or, or there maybe there's two episodes of the same show you're doing, maybe do one from 9 to 1 and another one in the afternoon. Um, but the, the, the difference with film is film, there is a lot of sitting around and waiting because the amount of time to set scenes up, to light scenes, to block scenes with stand-ins, to um, work scenes with the stunt people, like there's a ton of stuff before you actually get to acting the scene and using the actors. So there's hours and hours on, in, on film sets of sitting around, whereas voiceover, we're put to work. We work right away. It's not long days. Like it's your you, earliest. You, we usually start ending in voice is maybe eight thirty or nine. Latest you're usually going is maybe six or something runs into overtime seven. Hardly anybody ever records anything on a weekend. So it's um, time wise. It's just great to sort of have a, a pretty normal schedule to your life. Whereas film is all over the place. You can do a 16 hour day one day or 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 and then a couple days later you're doing a night shoot where you start it at 6 p.m. and you work till 6 a.m. So it's it's very different time-wise. Okay, so the last thing we do on Thunder Geeks, we always love to play games with our guests. So we're just going to ask you one of two things, this or that, and you give us your answer. So first one, are you a lover or a fighter? I am a lover. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Team Cap or Team Iron Man? Team Iron Man. Would you rather be eaten by a horde of gerbils or a flock of ducks? Oh, horde of gerbils. <laughs> Tacos or pizza? Tacos. Pirates or ninjas? Pirates. Burned to death or frozen to death? <laughs> <laughs> Burned to death. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Hollow deck or matrix head jack? Matrix head jack. Batman or Superman? Batman. Would you rather wipe with sandpaper or poison ivy? Sandpaper. <laughs> Cats or dogs? Dogs. Vomiting uncontrollably or pooping uncontrollably? Oh, <laughs> vomiting uncontrollably. And our most important question, who has the better booty? Dick Grayson or Peter Parker? Oh, Peter Parker. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Brian. It's been a pleasure to have you. All right. Oh man, it was so much fun being able to talk with uh, Brian Drummond there. He is, he was a delight. He's funny. Oh, just And beautiful. Kyle had the jitters and it was adorable. He's so nice. He is, he is. He kept just being like, it's okay, dude. It's the, okay. The best part is we just simply showed him our shirt and said we do a radio show. And he's looked at us and said, hey, you guys want to talk? And we're like, yeah, we do. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yeah, he offered it out. It was so nice. So we got in there after the autograph session there. We waited patiently, and it was... And it was Andrew so fell asleep, and I took the most amazing selfie of all time. True. Yeah, yeah. For, I'll talk about a little bit about my sleepy time in the next uh, segment of the show. Uh, we did get to talk a bit with Word Burglar as well. We didn't get to record that. He was right before our Thunder Geeks panel, but man, he also really, really great guy. We're going to try to get him on a Skype interview in the coming weeks. Yeah. He was so much fun. So, guys, we'll, we'll uh, stick a pin in it there. We're going to head to our next break here. Of course, you're listening to Thunder Geeks on 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at luradio.ca. We'll be right back. CILU! And we're back. You're listening to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at LURadio.ca. That, of course, again, was Double Experience with The Glimmer Shot. So, so we had a ton of fun at ThunderCon this weekend. First off, guys, thank you everyone who came out uh, to support us, came to our panels. New fans. Bought our we, shirts. Bought our shirts. New fans we picked up. Old fans that came to support us. It was so much fun. I always loved doing conventions and getting to interact with the community and really just hearing from you guys. Now, Rob has been desperate to reveal this, but before we do... But. But. 
before we do. <laughs> Of course, if you want a chance at winning Double Experience's new album, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak, and you'll like, share, comment on the show post or the stream there, and you get to take a bird's eye peek into the in the video. Rob, okay, one more time for our listeners coming back. What did we ask them? And let's find out the results. So, because of our ongoing debate, I decided to ask 100 Thundarians who has the better booty in comic books? Nightwing, Dick Grayson, or Spider-Man, Peter Parker? And out of 100 people, I'm going to hide the numbers, but specifically looking, you can see it was deadly close. Wait, before you reveal them, who do we all think in, in the room again? Oh, uh, Dick Grayson. Dick Grayson has the in-canon best booty in the DC universe. His uh, his butt is legendary among superheroes, supervillains, and the galaxy wide. And I'm gonna go with Peter Parker has the better booty. Cause Kyle, as we learned from Double Experience, likes little teenage boys. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> See, I love Spider Man, but anytime I think of Spider Man, I instantly think of like the '94 cartoon, and that's just kind of a weird butt to think about. So I I go with uh, go with Dick Grayson. See, I, 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 I don't know. I'm sort of neutral on it because, like, let's... Like, Nightwing... I feel like Nightwing and Spider-Man have different body shapes, but, like... They do. They I, do. I guess I would lean more towards Nightwing because I feel like Nightwing is more my type. And he's got that bubble, 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 but... Mm. <laughs> and yes, I am Team Spider-Man. But while doing this survey, I was extremely neutral in my wording. I would switch around. Sometimes Peter Parker is first, sometimes uh, Dick Grayson is first. Sometimes I say Spider-Man, sometimes I say Nightwing. And I had pictures for reference that you and I both agreed on. Fair. So, the final tally was, out of 100, Nightwing, 43, Spider-Man, 47. Woo! Woo! Oh, man. Yeah! Yeah! It is such, such a close thing. The thing that makes me happy, though, because since we started asking this question, Spider-Man has been dominating. And that was one of the things I said to Rob is, we never get a Dick Grayson answer unless we say Dick Grayson and Peter Parker. Every time we've used Nightwing and uh, Spider-Man, it's like Spider-Man instantly. This This gives me confidence that my goal to spread the gospel of Dick Grayson's ass is spreading. And... It, that it'll open wide and they will all see the light in that glory hole. See, I think that this isn't... <laughs> I tried, I tried. I think that there isn't a big enough uh, margin of difference in this, so I think you need to keep going and I think we need to expand. Leisha argues it's within the, the polling okay, area. I just want to go over something that we all kind of just brushed over. Wrong. 47 to 43 is 90. Okay, my math is wrong, but the point is it was still ridiculously close. But what if all 10 people voted for Dick? <laughs> well then. Yeah. Listeners. I, I demand a recount. I'm going to f- go full gore on this. I want more dicks. Okay. Okay. Next <laughs> next ThunderCon, I'll interview 500 people. Dun, dun, dun. 490. Well, judging by sure. the people were there were there, that that should be easy, no problem. So I want to go around the table here. What were you guys doing at ThunderCon, other than the show and the panels here? And the butts. What were you up to? Uh, Rob, let's start with you. Uh, well, I was being myself by going around, going to everyone, going, Hey, buy a shirt. Yeah, Rob made these amazing shirts for us, and uh, he all he said is, Trust me, don't question it. I'm getting a shirt. I bankrolled it. We'll see what happens. And then I got to see them right before the con, and I was so happy. If you want to take a look, of course, we are streaming again. Uh, myself, Rob, Megan, and Cal are repping for the team here. Megan, what about you? What are we up to during the con? <laughs> and our cameraman. Oh, yes, Tripod has it too. <laughs> um, during the convention, I was uh, I was a couple places. So I was either at the LU Radio booth uh, repping us, and or I was walking around talking to uh, people that I really like, you know, I'm stalking. I was just stalking people. <laughs> or... <laughs> Or I, was, I did a photo shoot with uh, Solworks Photography. Yes, I saw some of the pictures that they were amazing. Oh, yeah, he's he's great. And then I was also cosplaying as Quiet from Metal Gear Solid 5. My first cosplay ever, I, I felt so confident, actually. You made so many people happy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Alicia, what about you? What were you up to during ThunderCon? Okay, if none of this happened, you guys are going to have to tell me because I am so tired. Who knows what's real anymore? <laughs> 
So, um, oh, I was there selling my stuff that I make, and that was awesome. Every everyone loves cats. It's it's a proven thing. So Fact. yes, everyone loves gem cats. Gem cats. What else did I do? Um, I didn't get to do much because I was stuck at my booth. I did go see the Sugar Free Girls dance. Oh, lucky. I unfortunately was in a panel, so I didn't get to see them. I am happily anticipating the video they're going to release for their live. And I've, because I've been watching them since they debuted and stuff, and they have gotten so much better. You can see the practice that they've put in. I honestly started getting, like, a little bit teary-eyed because I was so proud of them. And the fact that they were also dressed as Sailor Scouts just, like, made my heart explode. And he had an awesome costume. Um, see, that was that was day two. So day two today. That was today. Yes, that, that <laughs> is today. <laughs> um, I yeah, I actually cosplayed because day one it fell apart. Um, I was finally amethyst Yay. from Yay. Steven Universe, and I uh, got some uh, got got a picture with Megan there. <laughs> it's a good one. And uh, I visited the Poker Stop in the lobby too. Quite a bit, quite a bit. It was right near the Starbucks. Kyle, what were you doing during the convention here? Uh, most of it for myself. I was wandering around, you know, doing doing whatever convention people do. But uh, Chris and I were basically uh, running the gaming room uh, upstairs, setting up, watching people go in and out, playing whatever consoles we have it all marked down, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I got to dress up. Actually, a Spider-Man, Superior Spider-Man. Thank you, Rob. Shenanigans. I don't think Kyle was dressed as Spider-Man. Uh, our, our cameraman <laughs> tripod pointed out to us hey. that he was in fact Spooderman. No, no, no. I, Superior Spooderman. Superior Spooderman. <laughs> I was, I was, I was Spooderman the whole time. Minus when little kids wanted to take pictures because they wanted Spider-Man to be the hero. So I was like, <laughs> oh, I gotta stand up straight, I guess. And I was like, all right, let's. <laughs> and like my back snaps in like nine different positions, and I'm like. Spider-Man's here, kids. <laughs> <laughs> but you're so happy. And how many thwips did you say? There are so many thwips. Um, but a few other things, like I wanted to like point out. As you saw, I got to go see the Lollipop Dance Group, and again, also wonderful. They did fantastic. a fantastic thing. They were uh, Team Rocket. Yes. And actually, at the end, um, a surprise thing for most of them is they got they hired the Star Wars people to come in. And arrest the entire dance group. The Mandalorian <laughs> Mercs. The Mandalorian Mercs came in and arrested the dance group, to, unknowing to them. Uh, only like two of them knew. Props to Sabrina for running. She just beelined I was like, out That's of there. my girl, go run. She was like, no, I'm out. It's gone. <laughs> I was close to getting arrested myself. They were running, uh, the 504 was running a, ch uh, a charity drive for the Humane Society where people would be kidnapped and locked into jail. The problem with mine was, is we're sitting, I'm like half asleep and we're waiting for Brian Drummond to suddenly come up. And it's like, I'm so, I, I can't, I can, this is like the one time during the entire convention I cannot touch it. But Sleepy You was so salty. Oh it was hilarious. God, you were I so mad. We thought you were gonna punch the guy. Um, other things I dressed wrote, in a skirt, no less. <laughs> other things I liked uh, that I got to actually witness was the not Doctor Horrible sing along blog. Oh, it was it was awesome. They just went up and they basically recreated Doctor Horrible, but in a short form. So it was only about half an hour long. Basically went over whatever we needed to, you know, reminisce about Doctor Horrible. So, for me, I was running through between the game room, and then I got to run a couple panels there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, right on the first day there, I was running trivia, and I got, I got a decent amount of people in the room, and there was so much fun to work with. We were playing uh, off of each other, and I, I saw a lot of smart kids there. So, in the trivia, I was doing four categories primarily. Uh, I had Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, comic books, and then science. I wanted to throw in some smarty stuff there. Some of the children there, wow, I was impressed because I still didn't know some of that information as an adult. These guys were still in elementary school and they were answering things like, you know, element, like I was asking like element, uh, periodic table. Uh. I'm curious. Do you still have those questions to see? Because I don't think Kyle and I were there. I want to see who's going to do I was. I was there when he was oh. making them. I wasn't there though. Me, Me and Megan then. I think I have a question. I don't remember the answer to it. It was about the four... Um, elements of science or something like that? Oh, th it was the, what are the four fundamental forces of nature? Mm. We're going to bring in your grade 10 science here. 
I have no idea. I know gravity is one of them. Do I left high school in like grade ten? Rob's right, and uh, that was the only one they could name in the room as well. Everyone what remembers gravity. It? It's the strong force, the weak force, uh, electromagnetism, and gravitational force. Huh. But I, uh, I just want to point out, as you're, we have, Rob has a great story about like kids knowing a lot. The the Spider Man oh, kid yeah, that yeah. came to the booth that so, was amazing. I I was sitting at the LU booth and a small child about five years old I would guess is in a Spider Man costume. And I'm like, hey, hey, Spider Man. He's like, I'm not a Spider Man. I'm like, my apologies, Ben Riley. And he's like, thank you. Wow. <laughs> he spe- he specifically wanted to be called Ben Riley. Beautiful. It's a nice little touch there yeah. and. That's something that excited me as well, seeing all the families that were out there. Uh, there was one moment in particular in the gaming room that I really picked up on. It was in a father and son playing Turtles in Time. And the father obviously knew what he was doing. He picks Donatello so he can then protect his kid. And they're just working. You Seeing father and son just work off of each other playing a video game together, it's a small moment. It was something that could really only happen within a convention like that because like it... They had, there was, they had no reason to go back to the Super Nintendo. And watching people share that passion, it, it just makes me feel really good. For me, a lot of the standout um, were the cosplays. And I, yes. I I freaked out over some of them. My top ones, uh, there was Olena, the Queen of Thorns from Game of Thrones. Yes. yes. And I believe we did get a picture of her on the iron chair. Someone did. Nice. Out there. I would support that decision. Uh, the Predator. Predator, yes. Uh, I believe he is he the owner or manager of Joey's. He, I, I don't know. He works in a, he does work at Joey's. His name is Dave. Yes. But one of my favorite interactions with that is he was taking pictures, and there was this little kid, like yay high, five years old, dressed as Iron Man, and he had a lightsaber, and he was trying to beat up the Predator, and I was just like, this is <laughs> the most beautiful geeky mashup I've seen. They see their hero moment. My one of my favorite cosplayers was actually a little boy. And he was dressed as Mega Man, and his helmet and his yes. and his blaster lit up. And he was he was very very proud and passionate about his cosplay. He stood in front of me for like ten minutes just talking about. it. I was like, "You're so awesome!" Yes, he stood in front of you because of his cosplay, not yours <laughs> at all. I was I was being a little bit more modest when he was around. I was covering. Kyle, did you see any favorite cosplayers out there? Uh, I have to definitely give it up to Azariah. Wow. The uh, Heaven's Wheel Ezra cosplay. Oh, my God. And the Charizard warrior that she made today, by the way, all have, like, full fleshed out backstories. Mm-hmm. Really? She has character sheets for them all. Oh, that is yes. so cool. It's it's a, It was amazing. Even though it was short-lived, my favorite cosplayer was me and Andrew. <laughs> yes, uh, me and Rob went as Blue and Gold Booster Beetle. Uh, sorry. Booster Beetle. Booster Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, I've done it too. That's that's going to be our couple name. Uh, I, I know we don't we don't have Brangelina anymore, but we do have Booster Beetle. But Booster Gold and Blue Beetle, uh, that was a lot of fun. We were going to do the live show in costume, and then I realized a fatal error I can't use my laptop mouse pad with spandex on, so I was like, oh, this isn't gonna work. Shoot. And and my zipper broke because Andrew got a little overzealous getting me in my clothes. He was just like, ah, zip. Yeah, Whoops. usually it's the other way around. I'm just overzealous to get you out of your clothes. <laughs> I, I know, it was a shock. But they'll be fixed eventually, and then you and I get go on a blue and gold rampage. See, uh, I learned something about the live show here. So we're talking about things that scare us. I'm never doing that again during a live show because I talk about how the penguin from Batman Returns scares the <laughs> ever-loving bejesus out of me and not five minutes later does a cosplayer walk into the room dressed as the penguin. It, <laughs> but it, in defense, it was the 66 penguin. Burgess Meredith? Yeah. I got to say to you, thank you, Rob, for letting me walk around with the shield all day. Uh, thank you for letting me hit the shield and cause some below the waist damage. Oh, uh, that's true too. <laughs> My favorite part of the live show yesterday was me sniping people with Jolly Ranchers. Yes, <laughs> you yes. will miss the shot, and it's just like off into the corner. And I'm then like, I He's hit him in the head with one after. I hit him right in the forehead. It was great. It was a revenge. Uh, uh, today I got to cosplay a star butterfly. However, I was really, really sleepy. I hadn't slept overnight. Uh, we had to prep my makeup to make me look a little prettier and such. And working on this horror show sometimes takes a while. <laughs> but oh, it, it was so much fun. It was my first time cross-playing at a convention. And I was pretty nervous. I'm like, okay, I know I'm not in an anime crowd here where I know this is really accepted. This is a more general audience. 
Um, but yeah, everyone was really supportive. I got a lot of compliments, made me feel really good. And there, I actually ran into another Star uh, Butterfly cosplayer. She had an amazing wand that she had made. So that's going to be my next goal is to make the wand accessory for it. But yeah, I was passing out. I started trying to power nap any second I got just so I would be awake for the show. <laughs> You're just slipping in and out of consciousness. <laughs> when I was waiting for Brian Drummond, I was out for a bit. Like I, if someone would have touched me, again, and me. Ch check the check. Uh, I think we'll put it to our Instagram of and of Andrew and mine selfie. Yeah, Rob's just going around me taking pictures, and I have no idea. The best is when I swiped your phone. I also made the fatal flaw is. When I was cosplaying as uh, Blue Beetle, I was going to say Booster Beetle again, I was able to type on my phone if I pressed really hard, but I couldn't use the fingerprint scanner, so I took the security off my phone, which is one of the <laughs> biggest mistakes you can make around Rob. And I quote, I need to make sure my phone is unlocked today so I can use it, and then I need to relock it tomorrow. Andrew, Saturday. I completely forgot to relock it. <laughs> Uh, oh, good no. times, good times. But yeah, uh, if you guys see Andrew's desk, it's a little hint, hint, preview, preview for our next show. Yes, we will be doing our live show from ThunderCon next week on October 30th. It was a lot of fun. I loved being able to interact with the audience. One of these days, I want to be able to get a multi-mic setup so we can just set up a mic for the audience and we can have them come up and ask us questions throughout it. It's one of the things that's always hard to balance is like, okay, I need you to yell really loud and it's still going to sound far away. Just come up and just molest our mic a little. <laughs> Peter. Peter is like one of the best. Yes. He had the voice and everything. Oh my god. That was Adam Riley. He uh he does a lot of camera work and he is so much fun. He was on point with the character and not only that, he was snappy and funny. He had such a quick wit about him that I lost it several <laughs> times during the live show. Yeah, he was doing a lot of camera work today for the news and stuff like this. And at one point, he was taping this family, and there was this, like, guttural, like, growling scream all of a sudden in the vendor's room. And I was like, Megan, what is... And I looked down, and there's this three-year-old just wailing and going for it. They were... I don't know. They were just, just like, just the general ghoul. But... You can even tell from Megan here. You would not expect this sound to come from a child. Yeah, okay. It was beautiful and horrifying. <laughs> the best thing about it is Alicia thought it was me, okay? <laughs> Alicia thought it was me screaming it around. But this little boy, this little boy was just as... And he was like, he was walking around being like... <laughs> it was great. That'd be the same sounds Megan would have made if they had someone dressed as the Punisher. <gasps> Whoa! Okay. See? See? <laughs> 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 Did you have any standout moments during ThunderCon? There was a doggo dressed as BB-8, and I was like, doggo, 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 doggo. Uh, for me, one of the big things is I finally got to meet, uh, meet uh, Jamie Young from Phonetastic Creations, and I got to see his at at Walker and his BB-8 that he had made in person. Pictures are one thing, but being able to see all the detail and all the work he puts in up close. On the BB-8, he had uh, made it so he had the arm coming out and had a little LED for the lighter. And I got to relate a little bit. He, when we were looking at the at, at Walker, I kept staring at its butt, and that, that's the comment he made. It's like, my favorite part, as weird as it sounds, is the, the butt end of this. And I'm like, same. You have so much little details, like the vents on it and the little gears. He, does, he has it all propped up on itself. He doesn't have, like, uh, like wood dowling, clear dowling, like, within it. It was a fantastic build. Did you hug the Ewok? I didn't hug the Ewok. You missed out. It was so soft and fluffy. Um, honestly, for myself, <clears throat> well, there's you know getting to meet Brian. Yes. But um, other than that, watching R2 that gets to the one that rolls around the conventions all the time, I guess they have like a preloaded song or they have a speaker system inside of it. It has a Bluetooth speaker in it. They had it in the back of the Weird Al concert and they started playing music through it. Yeah, and... Um, Basically, he would like roll around, and if he saw anybody that's like Star Wars related or any kids that were, you know, happier, he'd start playing, you know, Happy by Pharrell. <laughs> and they would all just start like dancing around, or the one kid who screamed, beelined behind his mother, and was like, What is that? Get it away. <laughs> I was like, It's bigger than him. Uh, for me, it was all the costumes, seeing how many people would come out in costume, whether how like minimal or over the top they went. But on. Saturday before I was able to get my Amethyst costume together uh, there was this other little girl dressed as Amethyst and I just screamed at her I'm like oh my god hi Amethyst 
with this? And she's like, <gasps> um, and I was doing this while I was actually talking to another cosplayer who was dressed as Lapis Lazuli. Yes, Lily. She looked amazing as Lapis. I, I, it, she came out looking for me. She's like, I, I know you'd want to see this. And I was just like, <gasps> She, they had the white out contact lenses so they were doing lapis when her gem was still cracked and oh just she she nailed it yeah. and i know there was also a pearl at one point in the hallway too and i'm like i yes. picked the wrong day to do amethyst one of the really smart kids in my trivia had a steven shirt on as well i, I just kept calling him red shirt and then i realized that it was a uh, the steven shirt on it <laughs> yeah uh lily sat in front of us during our live stream and stared into your uh, eyes with her dead soul and it was beautiful <laughs> and i loved every second of it um i guess my favorite part of the convention was uh interacting with the cosplayers that i usually would like you know idolize and stuff and they were like your cosplay looks really amazing and i was like <gasps> you think i look good like oh my god um and then obviously like doing the live show was fun um because like just interacting with the crowd and getting to meet new people that i I'd never really met before and then uh doing the the shoot with also works photography was really fun yeah um and then i guess uh the, the last thing that i really enjoyed about the convention was i went across the i went across the road to the uh, artists that were in front of us and one of them drew me a beavis and butthead and oh wow the one thing that i love about artwork is that like he put his own little spin on it and it looks like personalized and it just i just i like his art so now i get to have a beavis and butthead print but you know with his artwork and then there's your, your there's your little mini one and i described it <laughs> the style it looks like the tick dressed up as daredevil <laughs> and now megan's gonna do some artwork of that <laughs> yeah i picked up some artwork as well uh i'm trying to remember who the artist was it was the booth right beside you alicia paper beats rock paper beats rock from winnipeg they did this uh, three-set uh, picture where they had the Pokemon starters dressed as uh, benders from the Avatar universe. <laughs> it looked so cool. Uh, we have our webcam coming in uh, for us streaming on Twitch, so I'm going to start doubling it up. And I'm like, my white wall's really boring. I need something for it. And I saw this, and I'm just like, I need that. I need that right now. I don't care what it costs. And it, I'm so happy to have it. It's beautiful. And I got to pick a, a couple uh, stickers up as well from Ghost Jr. I need to put them on my laptop still. Which ones did you get? I got uh, Kyube, Kiro Barros, uh, Sakura, and Homura. I just picked up some ones from her, uh, from their uh, 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 Overwatch set. I got Bastion. I got Junkrat, because that's their favorite. And then I have... Uh, 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 Soldier 76. Soldier 76, uh, McCree, and uh, my big buff lady. <laughs> Zarya. Yeah. Guys, do we have any final thoughts about ThunderCon before we wrap up the show here? Thank you to everyone who attended, and super mega hyper thanks to anyone who bought a shirt and took buttons and took prints. I'm with Rob on that one. 100%. I'm sad that we have to wait a full another year for ThunderCon again, but I think I'm going to need a year to prepare for it. <laughs> Same. Completely. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in and for everyone who came out to ThunderCon, who interacted with us. We could not do the show without your support. And it is just so gratifying. I, I cannot say how much we love you. Our final song here, again, is going to be from Double Experience. If you want a chance at winning the album, of course, go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash thundergeekspeak. Like, share, comment on the show post or stream. Uh, and if you want to f uh, follow us on our other social media, do so on Tumblr, Twitter, Snapchat, or Instagram at thundergeeks. Want to send some fan mail, some emails, some erotic fan fiction? Do so to our email at thundergeeks at luradio.ca. Our final song from Double Experience is going to be See You Soon. Of course, folks, tune in next week, 10.30 p.m. as always, to 102.7 FM CILU or around the world at luradio.ca. We're your Thunder Geeks, and we'll see you next week.